welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. <clears throat> I need God. Do you need God? Anybody in this place need God besides me? All right, good. Okay, stand to your feet. Let's go before the Lord. Thank you, chaplain. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives today. We haven't come to hear from a man. We haven't come to hear from a woman. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We thank you for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and lives now as you bless us this day. But Lord, we would have that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest and Old Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center. Thank you for the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination, Lord. We thank you for Emmanuel and Trinity and Ecclesia and the Way and San Bernardino Temple. We thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters. At no time, Lord, do we see ourselves as better than them but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. Jesus, mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. Take your seat, get your Bible, go with me if you will to Hebrews 5th chapter, verse number 5. Sometimes in the word of the Lord, I want you to hear me now, things are being said without being said. That sounds kind of funny, but have you ever seen somebody's body language? And their body language speaks as loud as the words that are spoken? Of course you have. Sometimes you will find Jesus doing something and he is teaching by what he is doing, not just by the word but by what he's doing. When you look at verse number five, there's something there that speaks about you and speaks about me in the fifth chapter of Hebrews. I'll read it to you and then I'm gonna come back and give you the title of the message and explain what this is all about because I want you to hear this. Without an understanding of what you're going to understand today and see by the end of today, there's a real possibility that you will never be blessed like you desire to be blessed. That's a pretty bold statement. Let me say it. There's anybody in here that doesn't want to be blessed by God. Without an understanding of what you're going to learn today, there's a real possibility that you will not be blessed as God would love to bless you and you want to be blessed. So you need to listen closely to the word of the Lord today. I'll go fast. In fact, I'm going to go so fast, I won't even turn to a lot of verses. We'll put them up on the overheads for you to see for yourself, and you can mark them down and make notes. The fifth chapter of Hebrews, verse number five, says it like this. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. And I just want to stop right there and I want to think about it just for a moment. Here you see Jesus as our example who could have come to this planet and glorified himself. He could have said, listen, I'm God Almighty. I'm the creator of the heavens and the earth. I'm the word that created everything and holds it all together by the power of his might. I want you to know that I could call upon the legions of heaven to come and assist me. I came from a palace that the streets were paved, by, paved of gold and the gold was so transparent you could see through it. That's how clear the gold is of heaven. I could have come and he could have done that but he didn't. I find out something interesting by looking at this verse. 
that one of the things he did not do is he did not exalt himself and he stayed in a position of humility. And when there's a position of humility, there's the power of God that backs the humble person. Where there is somebody who is exalting themselves or in any area of pride whatsoever, there is the resistance of God that stops them. In fact, the word of God makes it very clear that God will resist the proud, but he says these words, I will give grace to the humble. And here you see Jesus not exalting himself when he could have. Can I just tell you something? If Jesus came to this planet and said he was all of that, would there be anybody in this room that would say, no, you shouldn't talk that? We would all say, absolutely, that's true, you are that. It's what you are. Wouldn't he, if anybody could have bragged, it should be him. But it wasn't him. And what we need to see out of this is that there is a war going on on the inside of you and I. And this war is between pride and humility. And in fact, we like, need to be like Jesus so that the Father cannot resist us, but that can honor us and bless us. And that's what the word of the Lord has to say. So as we look at this, if you're making notes, here's the title, part number one. The war between pride and humility. I need to know that my flesh oftentimes, and so does yours, wants to rise up in something called pride and exalt itself and lift itself up, be recognized, approved, and accepted by man when in fact God's calling me to not glorify myself and to be like Jesus and let the Father lift up who he wants to lift up. Clearly the word of God, I want to repeat it to you again, God resists the proud and God gives grace to the humble. Therefore you and I who need the grace of God need to operate in the principles that you see in verse number five of Hebrews, fifth chapter. I want to give to you a definition, if I may, of pride and humility. Simple. Pride, self-exaltation. Humility, God-exaltation. Just as simple as that. You're either going to be self-centered or God-centered. Let me say it again. You and I are either going to be self-centered or God-centered. It all started, this war, back in the garden. How did I get to a place where I want to lift myself up? Where I want to make decisions for myself? Where I want to feel good about who I am and where I'm at and what I'm doing? That seems very normal, it seems very natural, but how did I get there? How did I get to the place where I'm self-centered instead of God-centered? How do I get to this place where I'm in pride, oftentimes without even recognizing and knowing I'm doing it, instead of humility, when pride stops me from the blessings of God, but humility brings the blessings of God. Therefore, I've got to operate in something contrary to what I feel oftentimes. How did I get there? It all goes back to Genesis, the second chapter, verse number 17. God speaks to Adam and Eve and says, listen, of all the trees in the garden, you can't partake of this one. Don't touch it. The tree of knowledge of good and of evil. When you do, you'll die. First couple of verses in chapter number three, they partake. All of a sudden, from that point on, now they can decide for themselves what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, whether they're secure or insecure. First thing that you see there is, a, a, if you will, you'll see Adam, and Adam is coming along. What's he doing? Covering himself up because he's naked. First question to Adam... Adam, who told you you were naked? You ever thought about who told him he was naked? Can I tell you who told him? He, he did himself. He told himself. Now he's starting to evaluate for himself where to go, what to do, how to do life. Before that, guess what happened? Before that, there was never that personal evaluation. 
There was just a trust in God. You followed God. You heard from God as a human. You did what God would have you to do. He gave you directions. He took you to where you needed to be. But now, since the partaking of the tree of knowledge of good and of evil, all of us from those generations pass us along. And now it's about us making decisions for ourselves. Self-centeredness brings us into pride. That stops the move of God that wants to bless us. And here you see this with, if you will, with Jesus. Jesus didn't come back and act self-centered. Could have, but didn't. Jesus comes back and in fact, he says it like this. The words that I speak are not my words, but he that sent me. When you see me, you see the Father. In other words, he was so in tune, so one with the Father that he was the exact replication of the Father, just like Adam was before the fall. Adam was just carrying out what the father told him to do until he partook of the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. Now he has the ability for himself to make decisions. Now he gets in this insecure position and starts to make decisions for himself, which becomes self-centeredness, and self-centeredness resists God. Instead of dependent on God, he becomes one who is independent from God. Wow. I want to share these verses for you because of time. I'm just going to pop them up on the overhead. Proverbs, the 16th chapter, verse number 19, says these words. Proverbs 16, 19. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoils with the proud. Why? Because when you're a humble spirit, God's with you. You need God a whole lot more than the things this earth has to offer. By the way, the Bible says that God's not against giving you the things of the earth. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and, and his righteousness, and then these things will be added on to you, Matthew 6, But here he comes along and makes a statement. It is better to be humble, have a humble spirit with the lowly. A lot of times we have an understanding that humility is being low. Being a low lifer, not having anything broke down, busted, disgusted. And I've said it to you a million times, that's not humility, that's stupidity. What humility is, is dependency on God. It's where you're in that place where you're saying to yourself, man, what you say goes, where you tell me to go, I go. What your directions are, even though I don't feel like it, even though I don't think it, even though I don't want it, even though it rubs me the wrong way, I'm going to do what you say because you're a just and righteous God. And know what's best for me. And he says it's better to be, now notice what he says, better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly. He didn't say as lowly. Than to be somebody who's, listen to this, divides the spoils with the proud. And therefore he's calling us to a position of humility. One of not self-centeredness, but God-centeredness. And it's your call and your choice. In fact, Jesus comes and sets you free so you can make the choice. The choice is I'm free now. I don't have to follow my flesh. I don't have to follow the ways of the world. I don't have to follow the economy of this world. I don't have to follow society or social system. I can now follow God. That's what Jesus did. And then he fills me with the Holy Spirit that gives me the power to follow God. Oh, come on, somebody. I want to take you to another verse if I can. Proverbs 22, verse number four. Here's this powerful verse talks about you and I. May I read it to you? Verse number four comes along and says, by humility and fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Can I just say something to you? You want riches, honor, and life. You work all your days for it. Riches, honor, and life. Don't tell me you don't, you do. If you tell me you don't, you're lying and will cast the devil out of you after church. <laughs> you do. And you get these rewards two ways. Number one is humility. Number two is fear. See it up there? Let's talk about humility for a moment. If I'm going to get these rewards of riches, and, and, and uh, I'm going to get these rewards of, of uh, life and get these wonderful rewards of uh, existence and the blessings and honoring of the Lord, then I'm going to have to find myself in a place where I'm going to be where God wants me to be. And here he comes and he makes this statement, humility. 
I don't know how to define humility any better than what Jesus defined. And let's look at our Bibles and see what Jesus defines as humility. Look with me, if you will, into Matthew, the 18th chapter. In Matthew, the 18th chapter, Jesus is talking to his disciples. They absolutely ask him an amazing question. Verse number one comes along at the time his disciples came to him saying, who then is the greatest of the kingdom of heaven? Now, isn't it interesting? Who then is the greatest of the kingdom of heaven? I would expect him to say, well, Paul, you don't know him yet, but he's gonna come along. He's gonna write two thirds of the New Testament. Maybe it's Paul. Maybe it's Peter or John. Who's, who's, the, great, who's the greatest of the kingdom of heaven? He doesn't, he doesn't talk about a person. He talks about a position. Isn't that interesting? Watch this. Verse number two comes along and he starts to answer it. And Jesus called little child to him and set him in the midst of them. I love the words. You ought to circle it in your Bible, little child. Really important for you. Watch this, verse number three. In verse number three, and he said, Assuredly, I say unto you, unless you are converted and become as a little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Notice the words. Unless you become converted and become as a, unless you are converted and become. Let me try it again. Unless you are converted and become. A lot of people become converted but never become anything. Are you following this? See, sometimes we just hear things, we don't see things. So he says these words, I say unto you, unless you are converted and become as a little child. I had you circle the word little child before. He says, by no means you will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Then he goes on to explain about humility. Watch this, next verse, verse number four. Whoever humbles himself as a little child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now he talks about anybody. It's gonna just simply walk. But the object is whoever humbles himself. I now have the freedom by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to not put up with what my flesh says and not do what the world says or do things the way everybody else does. I now have the power of God that dwells on the inside of me to live a certain way. And that's why he comes along and makes this, who is, he says, therefore, whoever humbles himself as a little child. I was with my grandson, one of my grandsons. I've got 11 of them. And uh, it's with my year and a half old. His name is Bjorn, Pastor Luke's son. Pastor, you, uh, Luke has a little boy named Bjorn, a year and a half old, and he's an appendage to his mama's side. Where my mama goes, the little boy goes. Wherever he goes, she goes. You could not find them after a couple of days of spending time with them where they would be separated at all. They were together all the time. What a job, a hard job, following around a little guy like that. Now, if it was a big guy, big child, it would be different. Big children make decisions for themselves. Little children, I was watching this little child, he's a year and a half old, he eats when mama tells him to eat. Of course, he cries or complains if he doesn't like it. He sleeps when mom tells him to sleep. She changes him when he's wet and got poopy diapers. She does all the stuff for him, and all he does is follow the directions of the mom. She, he is dependent on the parent. And Jesus uses the example of you and I being humble as someone who is like a, not a big child, but a little child who is completely dependent on the parent. Which, by the way, the way it was before the fall of the garden of Adam and Eve. Cold, totally, completely dependent on the Father. And he says, if you've got to humble yourself, in other words, take yourself into this position and get out of yourself and get into dependency on God. 
I can make a choice. I can live the way I want to live, live according to my choices and my direction. I can get directions from my life from all kinds of situations in life. Or I can get directions from my life from what Father says. Jesus makes it very clear. Powerful verse. Two things, if you will, that will bring you to the rewards of life. Number one was humility. Number two was fear. Fear means a respect for God, a reverence for God, literally an awe of who God is. Because without an awe of who God is, we have an awe of who we are. We have an awe of who the world is. We're always, you know, if you ever walked into the presence of a human and you felt yourself feeling very insecure in the presence of a human, may I say something to you? Your awe is in the wrong place. And we do that all the time. And God is looking for a people, number one, who will be humble, put him first and take directions from him. And number two is somebody who will just simply, simply go along and have a respect and reverence for God to the place that's above everything and everybody else. Without it, man, we don't make it. Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, verse number 12, says it like this. And now, Israel, what does the Lord God require of you? Can you imagine that God came into this room today and said, listen, I, here's, I want to I tell you what to do. Here's what I'm requiring of you. Did you know that most people, when they get saved, they say, okay, God, what is it you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? How do you want me to be, God? Here God tells us. Here God tells you what he wants from you. Wrapped up in this one verse. Here's what it is. Here it is. Oh, Israel, what does God, your God, require of you? But to number one, fear the Lord. Do you remember back in Proverbs 22, verse 4, it says, honor and fear brings you the rewards. Do you remember that? Did you know you can't fear until you honor first? You can try to fear, but until you get out of yourself and see him as the ultimate, you'll never fear until you honor first. That's why he had honor and fear in verse number four of the 22nd chapter of Proverbs. Fear the Lord your God, walk in all of his ways and love him. Serve the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul. Watch verse 13. Verse 13 comes along and says, And to keep his commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Did you know that God is always after your good? God always wants to bless you. God wants to prosper you. God loves you. God wants to take you out of a position that'll destroy you and bring you into a position that'll bless you. You say, what is that? Simple. Back to a little child, following God instead of trying to get God to follow you. And that's what this is all about. When you are self-centered, you follow yourself. When you're following God, you are now God-centered. Is anybody listening? And it's for your good. Everything God does is for your good. Even though what he says oftentimes rubs you the wrong way. You don't like it. This is not my plan. This is not what I hoped it would be. This is not the way I want it to be. This is stupid. How does it work? This is the dumbest thing in the world. Man, but if you just do it because you're like a little child honoring the parent, guess what happens? Now, all of a sudden, it's for your good. You get blessed. Is anybody listening? And there are rewards. Now, if you'll go back with me, Proverbs 22nd chapter, verse number four. We're talking about the war between pride and humility. There are three things to see and you underline them in your Bible. By humility and fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. This is exactly whether you know it or not, exactly what you need, what you want, and what you work for every day of your life. And the way to attain it is through by submissively receiving from God. First, riches. Did you know the word riches there is not a word that comes along and just talks about money in your pocket? Word riches doesn't mean a whole, it doesn't mean you can't have money. 
because God wants to prosper you. But riches there is something far beyond what money can give you. Did you know when riches is like this, when my grandchildren sit on my lap and tell me scripture, I mean, that like blows me away and I didn't even ask them. Uh, riches is when my wife looks at me and says, you're better looking today than you were when I married you. That's riches, dude. Guess what? I know it's not true. That's why God dims the eye of the older person. But it doesn't matter. I, I still like it, you know. That's riches when she says she loves me more today and I love her more today than I did when we first got married when we were kids. Riches is having a dozen grandchildren that are all serving God. Let me tell you, when your children serve the Lord, some of you aren't there yet, but you're believing God for that to happen. That's real wealth. <laughs> Riches is when you fulfill life and you're finished and you're satisfied and you sit back with God and you say, God, I've done what you've asked me to do. I don't know when you're going to take me home, but I'm ready. I'm ready, God. And you're excited about going home. You're not depressed about going home. That's riches, my friend. While the rest of the fear, world fears that moment, a rich man is excited and waiting for that man. Oh. Riches. I like what it says in Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter, verse 18, just pop it up on the overhead. It says, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. Now that particular wealth is monetary. So God's not against you getting some money so that you can be a witness. He's actually on your side. We'll give you the strength. You say, well, how do I get it? Simply humility. Because where there's humility, he gives you the grace. Where there's pride, he resists you. Are you following me? And Jesus is our example of how he becomes this great heavenly high priest, not by exalting himself, but by the Father making a statement over him. Second thing, I want you to go back with me in Proverbs, the 22nd chapter, verse number four. There's three rewards that are great. Second one's honor. Let me give you a definition of honor, if I may. A respectful, a respected position. Look up on the overhead, honor. Listen closely. What we do is we really miss this completely. God wants to give you riches, honor, and life. And it's a respected position. What we don't realize is respected from people is not what we're trying to get to. And that what we need to get to is being respected by God. And we work so hard trying to be respected by people when people will respect you when you are respected by God. Can I say it like this? Listen to me. Listen, you'll love this. Listen to this. Love and honor are two separate things. God will always honor you, but he will not always, excuse me, God will always love you. God will always love you, but he'll not always honor you. He doesn't honor that which is out of sync with him. He doesn't honor sin. He doesn't honor complacency. He doesn't honor lukewarmness. He doesn't honor mental appreciation of God, no heart appreciation of God. Doesn't honor the efforts of a man when the efforts of a man are going towards the exaltation of a man. Doesn't honor that. And that's the problem, my friends. We work really hard trying to get men to honor us when in fact we need to get God to honor us. God honored David. That's why he became king. God honored Joseph in the midst of his problems and saw him go through the problems, trials and tribulations. Elijah, Elisha, Ezekiel, Isaiah the prophet, Peter, James, and John all honored so that their words would continue. And what we do is don't realize that in order to gain the honor of men, you first have got to gain the honor of God. If you gain the honor of men but don't get the honor of God, then your life is worthless. And you may 
look at look at our look at our movie, look at our Hollywood scene. Every year they roll out a red carpet and they honor themselves. Give me a break. I much rather have God honor me for a moment than the world honor me for a lifetime. An honor from God is so important. And we don't ever see it that way. But God says, I will give you honor if you'll do two things, humble yourself. Second thing, fear the Lord, God, with all of your heart. I'll give you the wealth that you need to have, and I'll honor you. I mean, can you imagine God honoring you? When God honors you, he gives you great favor. Let me say it again. When God honors you, you have great favor. Without the favor of God, you'll never get the job that's set before you done. Favor comes through honor. Honor comes through humility and fear. And may I say this to you, listen closely. It is a key to your success in every area is that you work on not the honoring of men honoring you, but the honoring of God in everything you do. And God will honor you back in this great favor. Somebody ought to say amen. Listen closely. I'll give you a quick verse on that. And so good. Proverbs, you're there anyway in the 8th chapter, verse number 18. And notice what he says. Riches and honor are with me. It's God honoring us, more important than men honoring us. Men will always let you down. Men will always criticize you. They'll always judge you. They'll, I don't care how good you are, how great you are, how much you do things the right way. Men will always let you down. But I'm here to tell you, God, when he honors you, that's the most important thing. And men may not celebrate you, but oh, you're celebrated in heaven with God because he honors what you do because you are a person of great humility and a person of great fear of the Lord. Somebody ought to give me a great big a amen on that. <clears throat> Third reward you receive through all of this hum wonderful humility and fear is the word life. Remember you circle it in your Bible? In Proverbs 22, verse number four, life is when you live life to the fullest. We have a whole society that says, are you having fun? I love having fun, but I want you to know my fun is when God's in my midst. And that's the greatest fun you'll ever have. It's the greatest time that you'll ever be in. When you live life to the fullest is when God is present. When you, because he is the giver of life. When you live life to the fullest, it's when your heart is set on him, his wants, his desires, his plan, his purpose, and you've gone your whole life serving him, the almighty creator of the heavens and the earth. That's life. At the end of your life, you know you have fulfilled that which God has called you to fulfill. You now have life. Someone says, well, how do I get it? I love this verse. In Ezekiel, let's just pop it up on the overhead. Watch this. In Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, verse number 11, says this. And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments. Watch this. Which, the biggest little word in the Bible, if. I'm free to do it or not to do it. I'm going to go to heaven whether I get blessed or don't get blessed. By his grace, I'm going to make it. But why live here down, out, depressed, discouraged? Why live here not knowing that God wants to do a great thing? Why exist on this planet without changing the world that you live in when God's given you the power to change the world? I mean, listen, one person says, I don't have to do anything. I'm saved. I agree. But can I say something? I call you to remind you of James. When James writes, I'll show you my faith by what I do. And I want you to know something. We need to do something in order to get to where God would have us to be. Which, if a man does, he shall 
live by them. I don't know about you, but life without God is no life at all. But life with God is all the life you'll ever need and you'll be fulfilled. That's a great word in every area of your life. Today, we see Jesus as our example. We see Jesus as our teacher who did not glorify himself to be the high priest, which he could have done, but the Father spoke over him. Then he gives us an illustration. By honor and fear, the rewards of life are yours. Worth working on, honor. Worth working on, fear. Every day, getting into a place where you're going to honor God instead of honoring yourself. Your feelings, your ideas, your ideologies, your philosophies. Oh God, I want what you have to say today. And you're going to honor the Lord. Second thing, fearing God. God, you're everything. I'm not messing with you. If this is what you want, I'm going to do it. I fear you, God. I respect you. I love you. I reverence you. But I also fear you, God. I'm not going to mess with you. You're my all in all. You're my everything. You're not one to be messed with. You're one to be loved. You're one to be appreciated. And I need you desperately. With that comes three great rewards. Number one reward that you and I, every day of our life, desperately need is the wealth of God, the riches of God. Number two, we found out that not only are we going to get that, but we're going to have the honor of the Lord, where God honors us. And number three, God has shown us today, if we'll just do those things, that we're going to have the kind of a life that you want. Can I ask you one question? Isn't it what you really want? Has anybody ever stood before you and said, this is what you really want? This is what you need to do in order to get what you really want? How many people have stood before you? How many professors in college? How many people and intellectuals understand? How many politicians tell you, this is what you really want? The word of God says, this is what you really want and this is what you really need and the way to get it is simply to be humble and fear your God with all of your heart and with all of your heart. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. <laughs> Woo. Isn't that a good message? Let's talk about you now for a moment. Nobody move. Let's just talk about you. Some of you that are in here haven't given God all of your heart, haven't given God all of your life. You can hear that today and clap and shout. But until you humble yourself, and that's what this is all about, humbling yourself, don't ever ask God to humble you. <laughs> You do not want God, who is very capable <laughs> of humbling you. Trust me, that's one prayer you don't want to ask. Oh, God, humble. Just humble yourself. It's a lot easier. <laughs> and in order to get right with God, you need to humble yourself. Right. And some of you are so full of pride, your thinking, your way of doing church, your way of doing God that you can't get out of it. You're like stuck in cement. Today is your day of deliverance. Today, there's a group of you that need to get right with God by giving God all of your heart and giving God all of your life. It starts with that. You will never get saved until you humble yourself enough to follow the Lord in his salvation. Jesus said, I am the way. You got to follow him the truth, and the life. And no man goes to the Father except by me. You'll never make it to heaven. Somebody needs to tell you, and love you enough and respect you enough to tell you. You'll never make it to heaven until you humble yourself and say, I'm going to do things God's way, and I'm going to give God all my heart and give God all my life. You'll never make it to heaven by being a good person. It's not in the Bible. You'll never make it to heaven, if you will, by you know, just doing nice things. You'll never make it to heaven because you hope you're going to get there. You'll never make it to heaven because your mom and dad told you you were a Christian, had you christened or baptized when you were a baby, put a cross or St. Christopher around your neck when you were a child. 
You'll never make it to heaven because you join some church singing the choir. But if you want to go to heaven, you're going to have to get to heaven God's way. And in for you to accept that, you've got to humble yourself to, to say, I'm going to do it God's way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He meant it. You can't get there my way. We can't get to heaven your way or some well-meaning church committee's way. The word of God makes it very clear how to get to heaven. He that was beaten, a bloody mess, and nailed to the cross, raised from the third day for you, seated now at the right hand of the Father, proved to be the Son of God for thousands of years. Tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. And you don't get to heaven by being a sweetie, nice little person that just gets along with everybody in society and social system. You get to heaven one way. Jesus said in John 3rd chapter, you must be born again. And somebody needs to love you enough and respect you enough and honor you enough to tell you, you must be born again. Born again means this from the bottom of, from the beginning of the book to the end of the Bible. It means that you have given God all of your heart. You have given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been and always will be. All or nothing, all or nothing, all or nothing. I'll prove it to you. God forgive us in American churches for 250 years. We've watered this down. It's all or nothing and I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus himself is speaking. You've heard of the book of Revelation. He's Jesus speaking. He says, I'm coming again and you know he is. And then he says these words, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Wow, what a blunt, rude, in-your-face statement Jesus just made. I'll vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he really just said? He really just got through saying these words. People who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Here's lukewarm. Let me define it for you so we're all on the same page. Lukewarm, a little in, a little out. Lukewarm, a little up, a little down. Lukewarm, a little in, a little out. Lukewarm, occasional church attendance, occasional prayer. You're not against God. Watch this, watch this, lukewarm. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life. Oh, yeah, but he's not everything. And that's the whole point of this. There is no way you're going to heaven until you get to be that little child that humbles himself. You will never inherit the kingdom of God doing things your way. You're going to have to do it his for some of you, it's uncomfortable, but get used to it. That's what this is all about. For some of you, you're wondering how to do this. It's simple. Let's do it Jesus' way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. And you can put it right back down. So simple. I'll see your hand go up. And you can put it right back down. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. By the way, I already know you know who Jesus is. You celebrate Christmas every year of your life. You celebrate Easter every year of your life. You know who Jesus is. But you can't get to heaven with head knowledge about who Jesus is, nor can you become a real Christian because you know who Jesus is. The proof of that is the devil knows who he is, and he's not going to heaven, nor is he a Christian, but he's got head knowledge about who Jesus is. And it's not about what you have in your head, it's about what you've done with your heart. And today, here you are in this safe, friendly place. We've laughed together, we've sung songs together, we've clapped. You were great listening to the word of the Lord today. You got a lot of word today. Wow. And today, it's your day of salvation. Today, this is a divine appointment that you have with God. You've had a lot of appointments in your life, doctors, attorneys, painters, and plumbers. 
But I'm here to tell you today, God brought you here to get right with God. Are you listening to me? I'm talking to you. All across this auditorium, you say to yourself, well, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. Again, I've, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to pop my hands together. It'll sound like this. Bang! Your hand goes up and I'll see it. Will you be embarrassed? Maybe. But it's better to be embarrassed for a moment in a safe place like this. Th hear me now. Hear me. Than to be in hell forever and ever and ever. Because you care more about what people see instead of what God sees. Today, listen to me. Humble yourself like a little child. It may not make sense to you. But God knows what he's doing. Because it's with that humble heart that God wants to bless your future. And if you're not ready to start here by giving him all of your heart and all of your life, you'll never get to where you need to be. And today is your day. And somebody needs to love you enough and respect you and honor you enough to tell you the truth. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. All across this auditorium, get your hand up in the foyer by television. I'm speaking to you down at the Love Rock Cafe, down there in the courtyard, in the plaza uh, that you're listening to me right now. All across this campus, today is your day of salvation. Just get your hand up and tell an usher that's down there or get yourself back up here. Are you ready? Your call, your choice. One, two, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four. Thank you. Back there in family. Five. Thank you. God bless you. There's six. God bless you. Anybody else? Back over on this side. There's seven. Thank you. Anybody over here? There's eight right here. Thank you. There's nine. There's ten. Thank you. God bless you. There's eleven. There's thank you. There's twelve back over here. Anybody else? There's thirteen. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? There's thirteen wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? You need to get right with God. Today is your day. Anybody? Anybody? Back to the family room. Anybody? There's 14. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Is that a hand? Wave it at me if that's a hand. Okay, I got you. There's 15. God bless you. I wasn't sure. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 15 wise people. Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 15 wise people. Here's what we want to do. All 15 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. All 15 of you, have raised your hand, you're serious about God, get a friend. That's okay. If you're sitting next to somebody, say, come on, friend, I'll go with you. I want you to get your stuff, get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. Now, listen, you've been in church an hour and eight minutes. Most of you were late anyway. You haven't been in church that long. Give God a little bit more. Nobody leave during this period of time. We'll let you go in just a minute. Please, nobody leave. That's rude to the people that are coming forward. Let's stand. Let's welcome these people. If you raised your hand, or if you should have raised your hand, you come. Come on, you come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Come, come on, you. You come too. I surrender. I surrender. Come on, home. Come on. I surrender. Thank you guys for coming. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. Come on, we'll make room for you. Just come on straight on up here. Come on up close. This is Pastor Dave. I want to introduce him to you. He's going to do three things, and I don't want you to be fearful, so I want to tell you what those three things are. Number one, he's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. You need to invite him in. He's a gentleman. He won't come in unless you invite him in. He does not intrude unless it's your heart you're given to him. He doesn't come in because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. Now you need to invite him in. That's the way that works. Secondly, he's going to give you some free information. And now you're a Christian. What to do next? 
What does God want for you next? This information, you can take it home. A little booklet that I wrote. I mean, third grade reading level. So you can read it. I know it's third grade because I wrote it. And it has to be third grade if it's me writing it, you know what I mean? And so third grade, read, read about what to do next. And then, then he's going to tell you about SPT program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. He'll explain what that's like. If you're going to give God your heart and life, then let us help you get strong in Jesus. Don't go running back to some place where you didn't hear the word of God nor get saved. Come and this church God spoke to you. This church God wants to. I want to put my application in to be your pastor. I'll fight for you. I'll be honest with you. I'll tell you the truth all along. I'll say it like it is. I'll be blunt. You won't have any questions about what I mean. And I want you to know something. I don't know. Maybe some other pastors have fought for your soul. I just fought for your soul. So I want you to come to this church. Let us help you get strong in Jesus. That's what this is really all about. So a year or two from now, you'll be winning your families to the Lord, friends, neighbors. Life will be good. They'll be blessed, won't you think so? You guys will be blessed. That's what you want. So make the left turn and follow Pastor Dave right over this way. Come on.